right. So, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I want to welcome you to this Section 8 Fair Housing Presentation for Tenants. Uh, this is being put on by the Legal Aid Society of Palm Beach County. Uh, we will be joined by uh, Jay Roulet of Section 8 Consulting.com. But before we get to that, a little bit of information about us. Uh, the Legal Aid Society of Palm Beach County was formed in 1949 with just one attorney. Uh, its purpose was to give free legal advice to the economically disadvantaged, serving the interests of Palm Beach County residents. And if you're local, as you know, the population of the entire county has grown from 114,700 in 1949 to over a million and a half uh, as of 2022. This is our final webinar of Fair Housing Month. Uh, we've had some great presenters, uh, some great webinars. Uh, we had one earlier today for landlords, uh, all part of Fair Housing Month, which runs for the month of April. Uh, so this will be our final webinar and uh, we thank you all for attending. Uh, and if you've attended any of the previous webinars, uh, we thank you for attending those as well. A quick overview before we turn it over to Jay. Uh, a little bit of Fair Housing Act history. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 ended <laughs> discrimination in voting, schools, workplaces, et cetera. That was followed by the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which included Title VIII and the Fair Housing Act, signed April 11th, 1968 by President Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, the focus was really uh, turned back on to the Civil Rights Act of 1968 uh, on April 4th. Uh, it was spurred by the MLK assassination on April 4th, I should say. Uh, and then about a week later, the, that legislation was passed. Uh, since then, two major amendments to the Fair Housing Act. 1974, uh, sex was added as one of the protected classes. And 1988, disability and familial status were added as protected classes. So finally, real quick, I'm going to go over the protected classes, both here locally and around the country. Uh, so federal and state protections apply to any of these classes, disability, national origin, familial status, religion, sex, color, or race. Here in Palm Beach County, we have ordinances that also protect those with sexual orientation, age, marital status, and gender identity. And some jurisdictions go even further than we do here in Palm Beach County. In Miami-Dade and Broward County, source of income is considered a protected class. In Broward County, your political affiliation is considered a protected class, meaning that you cannot be discriminated against based off where you get your income or in Broward County, what party you're registered under. So about our speaker, I'm very excited to have Jay Roulet back with us again. He was here earlier for landlords. He's here for tenants tonight. Uh, he is a Section 8 expert with 20 years of experience and an excellent success rate of working with tenants and landlords and getting people into low-income housing and helping them navigate the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So he has a lot of experience and a lot of information that we hope is going to be helpful for you all who are joining us tonight. Jay's Section 8 consulting experience includes reading thousands of housing authority and continuum of care manuals, covering everything from Section 8 housing applications, operations, policies, procedures, assessments, tools, data manuals, and every piece of HUD and housing legislation <laughs> written on subsidized housing in the last decade. So very, very well read, very experienced, knows his stuff. As a Section 8 consultant, He's had the pleasure of serving thousands of low-income housing landlords and Section 8 applicants in every state of the U.S. He's worked as both a consultant and a district manager at many of the best affordable housing properties on the market. And I think I would argue most importantly, 
His greatest honor and privilege has been serving the thousands of homeless, disabled, seniors, and veterans who need this housing the most. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jay to give his presentation about Tenants' Rights and Fair Housing Act. Well, Josh, I have to say uh, that was a wonderful presentation. I would definitely have you in all our videos as well. <laughs> You're an excellent presenter. So today, um, when we discuss kind of the overview of Section 8, I think first and foremost would be best to kind of discuss some of the options out there before we kind of fundamentally understand uh, some of those rights that go into each, each type of program. Now, whether or not most of you know this, besides your public housing authority, there are a, a multitude of types of housing and subsidies and vouchers that you could be presented with. And along with that, I think your rights kind of change. So when you deal with a public housing authority, um, you have the option of uh, accepting a housing choice voucher. You have the option with public housing authorities where they not only issue a voucher, but uh, they also may own the building and then it becomes a subsidy. Beyond that, uh, there can be sub-designations to property under Code of Federal Regulation, many of which you may have heard of, sec subsection 811, uh, which is seniors, uh, sorry, uh, that a, a person 18 to 61 with disabilities. And then you have some other properties that are section 202, which are seniors with disabilities. And then you move from uh, the realm of public housing authorities to housing first programs or continuum of care. And in there, you have generally three options uh, of, of housing. You have the emergency housing voucher. For those that don't know, emergency housing vouchers in the beginning and for the most part of history have been that were, those were the type of vouchers that were uh, issued by the continuum of care. Well, at first they were uh, issued by public housing authorities, and then, but through the pandemic, that, that responsibility has now been relegated to housing first programs. Besides emergency housing vouchers, you have rapid rehousing for those that were affected by some situation, including pandemics or other loss of income. And that would allow a situation where you're able to get some of your rent paid over a duration of time, generally 90 days up to two years. And then as you utilize that program, the funding they, uh, they pay towards your rent will start to reduce until it eventually evaporates. And that typically happens between the one to two year period. And then, of course, you have permanent supportive housing for those that suffer from mental health uh, issues and may require a more permanent solution. It's not to be confused with project-based housing, per se, because that means the housing authority owns it and it's a project. But I would say to you that it would be tenant-based housing under a subsidy. And uh, so you may not find some of the unusual activities that you may find when uh, a housing authority owns a project base. Okay. Beyond that, um, you have the housing first, a public housing authority, sub designated properties, 202, 811. You also have through the housing authority, HUD Bash for veterans, which also has its own version of emergency housing. You may have uh, programs that are funded by BAWA, which is the uh, Domestic Violence Against Women Act. But that act often doesn't go far, further enough in its explanation, but um, that's one. Also, you have HOPWA, H-O-P-W-A, for those that may be suffering from HIV or AIDS and uh, need assistance under that act, okay? So there's a, a plendora of options when it comes to vouchers and subsidies and so on. So there's quite, quite a bit to learn in that respect. Now, getting on to the part that uh, most people want to understand fundamentally is the uh, duties and uh, rights uh, when it comes to dealing with landlords. A lot of situations come up. Our office gets a lot of calls. And barring those that require an attorney, we handle a lot of them, um, except for things like discrimination and where there needs to be a legal action, okay? Sometimes, uh, just like if you're working at a job, so you're working at Walmart and uh, you can't immediately file a grievance with the CEO. You have to follow kind of a due process and make sure you have a matter of record as you kind of go. Some may jump straight to an attorney. Others may be able to absolve their issues at the federal level. And there are many agencies that can handle your case. It's important that when you're discussing some of the issues that you may have, whether you're dealing with HUD, uh, the office, office inspectors office, which is a OIG, uh, or you're dealing with HUD's regional offices, or you may be dealing with FHEO with fair housing. 
a lot of clients tend to grievance many issues. Oh, well, I didn't like the attitude of the lady at the housing. I didn't like the attitude of that. I would tell you that when you have fair housing issues, that it's important to stay on the facts of the case and to narrow it down to one issue. You can't grievance every, every issue you've ever had. Otherwise, I would say to you that probably attorneys like Josh would tell you, you need to narrow it down to the, the factual point and uh, remain, it, try to keep your claim uh, or accusations to uh, a situation where it's less emotional, okay? But I don't want to get too far into that. That's the attorney's job, not mine. <laughs> Uh, so I want to go over the obligations. Tenants and landlords have obligations under the Housing Choice Voucher, better known as HCV program. When tenants select a housing unit, they are expected to comply with lease and program requirements, pay their share of rent on time, maintain the unit in good condition, then notify the PHA, which is a cool acronym for Public Housing Authority, of any changes to income or family composition. Look, guys, when you're dealing with PHAs and income, if you have any changes in income, you are required within 30 days to report that. If you go beyond that, you could put your HAP contract or under, you could put that at jeopardy, okay? They, they take that very seriously and they will terminate. And then you may end up in a position where you've got to go see a judge if you get evicted, okay? Uh, tenant specific obligations when qualifying for a voucher and to remain on the Housing Choice Voucher program. And that's what I want to kind of get into a little bit. So, First is going to be evidence of U.S. citizenship or eligible immigration status. And I want to tell you, that is a sticky one. Uh, in my opinion, we have people that have dual citizenship from around the world. We have people that uh, obviously have just come from war zones like, um, well, that kind of flew out in my mind. But we have a current war going on with the nation right now. We get a lot of calls from those individuals. So if you have a refugee status uh, green card, I would say to you that if you're on U.S. territory legally and you're seeking out proper uh, documentation and have been issued a Social Security card by the U.S. Uh, Social Security Administration, that uh, you may have an eligible status. It does cover quite a bit, and um, I don't want to get too deep into that one if, because it's quite lengthy. <laughs> so participating in a housing choice program as tenants or any household member or guest, it's important to understand the composition of the household. You're responsible for everybody, your pets, including the people that visit the property, whether they're living there or not. Behavior is simply behavior, and you need to be responsible or there might be an issue. So you have two different contracts going on, essentially. You have a con half contract, so does the landlord, with the public housing authority, and you must follow their tentative rules. And then there's actually the lease. And there will be, in some cases, leases that go further with addendments in there. Uh, if you're being warned uh, about your lease and you're getting a notice on your door in the mail or by email, then it means you likely have violated some part of that. Now, it doesn't always mean that uh, a landlord's grievances with you are legal. And in that case, you should seek out an attorney to assist you in that respect, and your local legal aid society can help you uh, there. So beyond complying with the lease, you must maintain the unit in decent condition. In other words, normal use is acceptable. Uh, pay the tenant's share of rent. Look, guys, uh, under HAP contract, if you're making side deals in order to get a unit and you're slipping money to the landlord beyond what's in that HAP contract, that is highly illegal. It could get you both terminated and the landlord. I would not recommend setting up those kind of arrangements uh, where you're giving kickbacks. And often that's what people are doing in order to kind of get an edge at getting the apartment over other tenants. Don't do it. Uh, allowing the landlord and the PHA to inspect the unit at reasonable times and after reasonable notice. Now, this can be a, come to a varying degree any uh, with all states and counties. I would say in most cases, an appropriate notice would be on the door or by email, official notification, and usually with a you know one to three day notice. Uh, they simply may not have the handyman enter your apartment without fair notice. Nobody should be coming in that apartment without your presence or without fair notice. You may not, in most cases, require... Uh, them to wait for you to be there uh they've given reasonable notice they may be under the premise um with that bare notice notifying the landlord and pha in writing before moving from the unit in accordance with the lease abandoning the units uh is not a good idea okay because you're violating your contract there and uh, if it's if it doesn't go on that way then you may uh, have some actions that you could potentially take 
uh, supply the PHA with any information that the uh, PHA determines to be necessary. This includes evidence of citizenship, immigration status information, and use or annual, uh, whether annual or special. Uh, certification family composition. You may not sublease bring other people in there. However, you do not have to be harassed by the landlord if they or believe that everybody visiting your house is perceived as a situation where you're they're actually living there. I've seen landlords try to twist that around a little bit and uh, make accusations. Uh, I think most leases outline uh, a degree of how long a person can stay, anywhere from a few nights up to two weeks before that's considered a situation where they've actually occupied the apartment. So I would say be mindful. If you go into the trouble to get a voucher, you go into the hunt that's hard to get this uh, housing, then you wouldn't want a lot of people showing up at unusual hours. And, you know, just show the same courtesy to the landlord to let him kind of keep him apprised who's coming. However, if it becomes a situation of harassment or you believe they become aggravated and now discriminatory towards you, I would at least seek out legal advice uh, as soon as you can, because typically when issues start, they tend to uh, flower into bigger things. OK, in other words, uh, you may be facing a number of issues, including uh, them attempting to give you verbal notices. If you don't have a written notice, then in my opinion, that may not even be legal. So again, defer to an attorney in that respect. To supply the PHA with information that the PHA determines to be necessary, this uh, includes evidence of, okay, so we already been over that, and the composition. So now we're going to go a little bit further in. Engaging, and this is from both parties, engaging and threatening abusive or violent behavior towards the landlord, PHA personnel, and that may also be the same to you. If you're being abused, now, there's a difference between rude, okay? And there's a difference between the being rude and then, of course, threats being levied against you while you're in a leasing office. I've seen that kind of behavior play out. It's important, guys, if it becomes adversarial with you and a landlord, that you should keep a witness with you, okay? You may not, uh, and it depends on the law. In most cases, if you're within in the side the door jam of your home, you should be able to record without permission, but I wouldn't advise probably doing that in a leasing office. So just bring somebody with you, okay, if you feel that it's going to go the wrong direction. Uh, participating in a, a illegal drug uh, activity and other things and violent crimes or just about any type of crime would not be suggested there. I've seen that been flipped where people have had uh, accusations of that being levied against them when in fact it's not true. That could be a potential issue. And uh, I would say to you that that is a possibly harassment or discriminatory action. It would fall under contacting the Legal Aid Society, uh, contacting Fair Housing, better known as FHEO. And depending on the how depraved it is, you may also want to lodge a complaint with the uh, the attorney general's office, but that's pretty, pretty upscale. I mean, unless it's a big issue where a lot of tenants or other people in the property have experienced the same thing, then I would say to you that uh, Legal Aid Society and FHEO would be the appropriate agencies to reach out to. Committing fraud, bribery, or any other correct, uh, corrupt uh, criminal act in connection with the program. So you want to, you know, remain doing the right thing on the property. Damage to the unit or premises and other damage from ordinary wear and tear. Look, leases do outline. If it's not in the lease, then really you can't, the landlord can't use that against you. Uh, if a relationship is becoming, it starts to de-evolve into adversarial and, they're trying to criminalize you, even have it potted plants and all these things. If it's not in the lease, then in my opinion, it's probably not legally enforceable. And again, you would that would be a form of harassment uh, for you. Uh, subleasing and subletting the unit or assigning tra or transferring the unit strictly prohibited, whether you're a voucher holder or you're participating in the HUD home ownership program. So I would suggest to you that if you're going to have guests and other people there, uh, it would just be a very common courtesy uh, to the to the landlord that you apprise them who you're, you know, let them know, you know, who might be coming around. That way it doesn't uh, kind of fall into that position where you're getting in trouble. If you want to view regulations that cover tenant obligations, they're found under Title 24 CFR Part 982, okay? Um, usually Cornell Law is good about that, and I'm sure Josh could expand greatly on, you know, those type of obligations. So let's talk about rights under Section 8 housing for FHA. But first, uh, to kind of do that, we, I think you already kind of covered, uh, Josh, um, the Fair Housing Act of 68 and so on. So I think I'll leave that part out. <laughs> um, 
so examples of discrimination and again guys you have a few remedies outside of legal aid side you can contact hud o-i-g f-h-e-o the department of justice in very very serious situations and the attorney general's office in some cases in your state may afford you some additional investigative powers if it reaches that level okay the landlord so let's discuss that and i'm going to discuss some situations that i'm going to discuss some that i've seen over the years from cases that i've dealt with um, landlords that say that an apartment is abatable when a prospective tenant calls or inquires over the phone but upon seeing that person uh, who's inquired is a uh, african-american a black individual Visual Hispanic or uh, other other folks that may have be of uh, Hispanic descent, and then says the apartment has just been rented. Okay, upon uh, hearing that acquired from a member of another race, the landlord says it is abatable again. That happens uh, more often than than most of us would want to to believe, and it's an unfortunate consequence of a very long history of uh, back and forth between some landlords. Look. When it comes to landlords dealing with you, they must deal with you regardless. Let's say it this way. Every, whatever rules are going to implement that are legal, including the, the rent, credit scores must match for everybody coming to that door. So if Saudi comes and they require a 600 credit score, they can't up it and, and go up or down with that credit score uh, and then accept somebody of a different race because of, okay? So whatever they administer, you better be administered to everybody else. If you're uncertain to the uh, uncertain of the degree of which they may be biasing you, then I would suggest having a friend go over and see if they apply the same policies and rules to them. If they don't, then you probably have a pretty good case uh, related to that, okay? A uh, real estate agent refuses to show a house for sale in a specific neighborhood because of race, religion, authenticity, um, and again, you know, I think it's important to recognize that county at the county and state level, uh, at the state level, there may be additional protection supported to you beyond that of the federal. So, but I would say also that it's rarely going to be. I don't think that most cases revolve around so much discrimination. But I think that most of you might encounter some form of harassment or. Uh, other behavior uh, when dealing with uh, landlords that are being impractical. And uh, so I would say to you that, um, again, you should reach out to the fair housing for that or an attorney. Uh, mortgage lenders that charge an applicant higher interest rates. Look, guys, same thing that goes for any landlord. They didn't charge the same amount for applications, okay? If there's going to be a change based on color and other protected classes, then you're being discriminated against, and uh, you should take appropriate action to reach out to uh, fair housing uh, that way. Because look, let me tell you something, just because you are a tenant with a voucher, a lot of you have it in your mind, okay, I went through all this trouble to get a voucher, I'm dealing with the PHA, if I do anything or say anything, then they're going to, you know, take reverse action against me. Do not be scared to report these people that got if, if a landlord has been if this is not the first time, you know, typically with landlords, if they've done this behavior before, if nobody's going to stand up and report it, then that's the problem. And so they may not retaliate against you. OK, um, <clears throat> so when I move on to the modern family condominium fails to comply with the accessibility requirements or Buildings Act of 1991 as such perspectives wheelchair bound buyer can't access a unit or parking there um so again if you have disabilities whether mental or physical and i also want to make a distinction about not accepting pets that's a big deal i get asked about that a lot there is a difference between an emotional support animal and that of a service animal emotional support does not qualify under most circumstances to necessarily force a landlord into accepting your cat or, or dog. However, if it is a service animal, then they would be required regardless of whatever nonsense they put in that lease. If you're unsure about that, I would definitely say you should defer to an attorney to see whether or not uh, they would uh, that would be moot or rendered moot in that contract, whether it's enforceable legally. But in most cases, if it's a service animal, it, it doesn't matter what that lease would indicate. Uh, rental, uh, a rental agent refuses to rent an apartment to buy to any single woman or, or child. Um, look, if you've got a multifamily, multi-generation family, a mixed family, or any other type of family, or maybe you're a, a, a pair of seniors married or not married, and you've got adopted children, you've got 
a situation where you're um I'm trying to think of the name uh when you have ado uh, adopted children there or you you may be uh helping out so it doesn't matter but in that situation they cannot deny that simply because you're trying to assist other children from other homes okay um going on to fair housing act enforcement under the fair housing act of the u.s department of justice and doj may file a lawsuit against a defendant who is alleged to have engaged in a pattern or practice of discrimination or discrimination against a group of people such uh, that an issue of general public importance so i think that probably it's kind of like a class action again that would be something josh would know a great deal about but when there's enough of that behavior going on with the number of attendants in the property then i think that at some point uh, department of justice or hud itself may go in and, and investigate it and i'd like to bring up a, a, a small tidbit since marissa fudge is headed hud i've seen better actions through HUD, they have. Uh, she's done an exceptional job, in my opinion, at HUD uh, with helping uh, really tighten up the ship when it comes to dealing with PHAs. There has been a lot of lawsuits. She, uh, Marissa and her staff at HUD have done an exceptional job lately with suing and uh, leveling the playing field. So I think that the the new administration that's been there currently with her and her staff has done a pretty good job. All right, moving on from there, cases that involve discrimination, again, with mortgages and loans, home improvement loans, uh, again, the Justice Department can involve, get involved with that. All right, I'm going to scroll through my notes here. Uh, recourse if a landlord doesn't take vouchers. You know, that is a serious, serious issue that's really starting to play out legally around the country. And what I can tell you in respect to that is there are source of income. So I believe it's called SOI, source of income. There are laws being played out and there's challenges in courts all around America right now because people are carrying vouchers and they're being denied because of the source of income, which may include TANF, T-A-N-F, or whether or not you're receiving any type of benefits. For those in California, it may be Medi-Cal or uh, other benefits from the state level. But these SOIs or source of income has been a big, big issue. Uh, I would suggest that depending on your state, if you're if you feel that they're investigated too far into your income and how you're receiving it, or they're directly asking that, I would see whether or not you're one of the states that uh, is considering that kind of a a law against it. Now, there are other states that uh, don't forbid it at all, and in fact, they're actually creating laws uh, as we speak in order to kind of devalue that. So source of income is a big issue. Um, with vouchers, you know, it's important. It's it's really a sticky relationship, in my opinion, when it comes to landlords and you having vouchers. I would often say to you that approaching, if you know the landlord is not a, a person's advertising vouchers, I would suggest coming into them like your market rate, not even bringing up the voucher, see the apartment and so on, and then seeing. Um, sometimes when you approach landlords, they'll, they'll it's hard to tell whether or not they're going to discriminate. Uh, many of my clients to give their best cases have, have built their own files uh, and pull out their credit history, their job opportunities, re re references and everything, put it in a nice, neat folder, and take it to landlords to give you the best opportunity to prove that, hey, you know what, I'm out here, I'm doing what I need to do, I'm fixed income, I'm a senior, and uh, proving your best case because it's, there's a very thin line between discrimination, I think, and uh uh actually being able to utilize landlords sometimes landlords may appear you may feel like they're discriminating but really they're looking for just a really good candidate and i don't think that's pushing it too far but obviously there are some issues that are playing out okay so i would say here that you must find a landlord is willing to rent and then uh, in most areas countries are not required to accept vouchers okay that is a reality but i think that as we start to see that housing is something that is you know, humans have to be housed. And I think that the more action, legal actions that are taken around the nation right now, the more decisions are going to be made and it's going to begin to where it's a little bit easier to use vouchers. You know, another thing, this is, a, of my opinion, dealing with clients that through the pandemic, uh, as I mentioned in my earlier video with uh, landlords, through the pandemic, uh, a lot of landlords had people that were market rate with jobs. And because of that, 
when the pandemic hit, a lot of people lost their jobs. When they lost their jobs, they got evicted. And so as that played out, I saw a very something very unusual kind of play out as the pandemic started coming to a close. Those landlords that were depending on all those people working jobs uh, really got burned through the pandemic. These people had no money, and then they had to evict. And the landlords that accepted vouchers went unscathed. So what it did prove is voucher holders have a check that will always always cashable by the U.S. government. And so what I'm seeing is a much higher level of landlords that have got that almost lost their properties because they had uh, market rate tenants now really opened their mind up to vouchers. So the, the market, is, the, the pandemic has made this more favorable. How much, to, to what degree, I would say, from what I've seen, uh, just doing business through the pandemic to now, there's been at least a 20% spike in my business in relation to land, landlords now taking vouchers seriously, because that voucher means that 70% of that rent, uh, in most cases, is going to... Um, they're going to have that money no matter what, so they don't have to worry what's going to happen through all the things we're experiencing in the housing and crisis, uh, inflation, and all the other issues that are going on in the nation. So you should probably be excited uh, that uh, this is playing out that way and more landlords are willing to participate. Um, so let's see. If a if only a small share of rental units are potentially available to voucher holders, uh, it can be an ongoing challenge for most of you as families to find a unit to rent, particularly in low poverty communities. And so, you know, I think that sometimes a very good move when you take a look at this market as a tenant holding a voucher, you know, sometimes you can contact city planning and development to see what's which subsidy properties could be available before they even hit the market or get advertised. So that's kind of a useful tip I wanted to throw in. Um, beyond that, um, when we look at the challenges of dealing with the uh, work program uh, and effectively there are about 11 states, including Washington, D.C., and over 50 cities in the country that have enacted the laws currently that prohibit landlords from refusing to rent the voucher holders like yourself solely because of the source of income. Often these uh, laws, again, are called SOI laws. And one thing I want to point out is you should definitely check online to see whether or not that's going to be a situation where you do have those additional protections. And then I would say, be reasonable. A lot of people, a lot of people that have vouchers, you know, we still have issues in the country, obviously, with discrimination and harassment. And then sometimes the landlords, some landlords can be lawless, but in most cases, it's working uh, the way it should. But if you're having you're having these issues and you believe that something has been presented in that manner, I would say rather than be quiet about it, at least attempt to report. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to expose you if you go to FHEO to any of these landlords. But if we don't do a better job of reporting and we're, we're living in fear of reporting these things, then uh, these uh, particular landlords uh, may have uh, that can continue to go on. And again, I don't think that the sampling of the market when it comes to landlords is so bad that we have to particularly worry about that. Uh, moving on from that, um, going back, I want to take a look at one additional note that I had made here. So we were talking a bit about COVID. Um, when it comes to COVID-19, I think that most of the eviction, uh, most of the evictions that uh, were being blocked around a nation are not being blocked anymore. So, if there's anything remaining on the market, it would definitely be at the county or state level for those of you that have concerns as to whether or not you can continue to remain in your apartment. Uh, and most of the render assistance or emergency rental uh, assistance that was afforded by the Treasury Department at this point has pretty much dried up. However, I'm seeing second rounds being offered by states. So a lot of states that may have a, a large enough tax base are starting to do a second round. I know the city of Houston, where I live, uh, offered up uh, a very sizable amount, and uh, I think about 60,000 people applied. So I would say that the assistance uh, for rental, if you're at real, uh, if you're at real jeopardy, uh, if you don't grab that now, uh, then that by this summer, I would think the federal dollars will dry up, and you can put yourself in a pretty precarious situation. So beyond that, 
I want to discuss a little bit of landlords and some of the behaviors you should be on watch for, okay? Many of you that do not go and use lists that the PHAs issue and you go to private landlords, I'm seeing a bunch of behaviors that should not be playing out on a private level. In other words, these landlords have gotten away with a number of things over the years, and they just simply may be unapprised of uh, the rules at the federal level or even state level, okay? Again, when we look at accepting the property, you should not move into the unit, apartment, home, trailer, or mobile home with them telling you they're going to fix certain things later. Uh, if they if they have legitimately passed a housing quality inspection, then that would be appropriate to move in. You may not uh, have a landlord uh, convince you to move in before a housing quality inspection happens because you're putting yourself at jeopardy. That means the landlords are making all these guarantees. And uh, if those guarantees aren't carried out, you can be far into your lease and a bunch of things don't work. It, you need to let the PHA carry out its housing quality inspection so you're covered under your half contract. Number two, landlords that become a little bit too aggressive, um, again, with the showing up with the inspections at any time without fair notice, that's not appropriate. You may uh, not have handymen come in. You, if you're a single female, and you've got handymen making entry in your apartment without your express permission, that is a problem. And you may request at the leasing office that you be present. You don't have to necessarily agree, but um, it's important to understand with the maintenance requests and so on that uh, they have an obligation too to get the, the, get it done. If you make it un, impossible for them to be able to visit safely and make the necessary repairs, then you're denying them access to the unit. And that could be a potential violation of the lease and they could act accordingly uh, in respect to that. Uh, the other thing that I see is whether or not we deal with a lot of black mold issues. Look, if the condition of the property deteriorates and the landlord's not making the appropriate changes that are necessary, then that becomes both an issue that should be reported to your PHA or fair housing. And also, um, if this goes on long enough, then you may choose to get a city inspector involved to make the required change. Now, this is where it gets a little bit interesting because retaliatory behavior it means that now they're going to write you up for every little thing that you do. You throw a bubblegum wrapper in the grass, and next thing you know, you got to notice the door. Uh, I would suggest to you that those retaliatory behaviors, I would watch out for that, um, especially if they're giving you notices. If it's not in the lease, then I don't see how that could actually be an enforceable rule unless you're violating the HAP contract. If your relationship with the landlord becomes strained, then I would suggest that you keep everything as a matter of record, email, text, or letters and just keep it simple and sweet, okay? I wouldn't set that on fire, um, but again, I, I'm not an attorney. I'm just suggesting that I've seen these situations play out and I've also seen them cool off. Uh, the landlord is not necessarily responsible for all activities that may happen. Uh, if you have a multifamily property and you're parking your cars and things get broke into, there are some liabilities and I don't wanna get deep into liabilities, but you know, landlords can only be limited, uh, liable in very specific ways, I would think. Uh, of course, their safety uh, of the property should be important. And uh, But if there's a rash of breakouts and it becomes a legal matter, obviously, that the, the property should address. But I wouldn't say that you should be reporting your landlord for every incident. Um, drug activity, prostitution, gang activities, and all those things that go on sometimes on uh, properties, uh, you sh you should uh, you should write a letter just saying that there's some activities going on. If that if that behavior continues to play out in the property, I would say that calling HUD would be an option, and then also reaching out to attorney, especially if it gets so bad that you're unable to go out at night or you're hearing gunshots and other things. Um, there are properties that are difficult. Okay, I won't make I won't make any pleasantries about that. I actually had a landlord that purchased a property and most of the tenants in there were not on a lease and a lot of bad activities. And these people were actually scared to even go on a property. It's important for you as a tenant uh, to make sure that you're visiting these properties. If you're going to use your voucher and join a property, you should go out there on the weekend at night at eight, nine o'clock at night and just see what's going on. If the place is alive and there's lots of things that shouldn't be happening there, then you probably want to avoid utilizing your voucher in that situation. 
Uh, the other things that I see out is landlords attempting to charge beyond what's being uh, what's actually required. That voucher should be covering your rent payment, and there should be a small subsidy in there included for utilities if it is master metered or if the uh, units come with all utilities um, together, okay? If they're attempting to collect other debts from you or charge you for other things, in most cases, that is not allowed. There shouldn't, there shouldn't be a charge for the plumber and all that. That is the responsibility of their maintenance. If they're unwilling to make necessary repairs that are affecting the quality of life for you, that's a problem and it should be reported. But those of you that are suffering from disabilities with a wide variety, everything from uh, physical disabilities to mental disabilities, if the behavior towards you, we actually, let's not even talk about the behavior. Let's talk about what would be fair and what would be reasonable. Many of you um, will want to, so I call it when, you, when you're when you trying to deal with uh, disabilities and I, I would suppose ADA laws, you can ask for reasonable accommodations or modifications. So when I say reasonable, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get a $50,000 handicap ra uh, ramp added, okay? I think that there should be a situation where if it's reasonable and it's not a large ramp and, and that's accommodation they're prepared to make, then that, that's fine. If you're asking the, if you're moving in with the consensus that you're disabled and you're moving in a, not, in a unit that's not uh, designed uh, for the disabled, let me tell you a good example. In one case, I had a tenant move in and it was actually a unit that was designed for persons with disabilities. So we had light switches very low. And we also had uh, the plugins very low as well. The problem was the person wasn't disabled and it should probably not have been read to them because they wanted to request a accommodation or a modification. Unfortunately, that is for those disabled. So that tenant got stuck in a kind of a gray area with this. They needed accommodation or a modification simply because uh, it was actually very strange to try to turn the lights or even you know, plug something in. Uh, the other cases I see is uh, big modifications to the bathroom. So they're raising the counters to accept a wheelchair, or they may be moving your, in one case, I saw a landlord attempt to move a lady's refrigerator or stove and microwave all into the living room. That, that kind of behavior and doing it that way, that is not a modification. I would suggest to you that they're actually illegally making modifications uh, to that apartment that are just simply not, you can't turn somebody's living room into a kitchen, okay? Um, but I won't go too, too far into that because again, I think that that needs to kind of, every case is a little bit different. The main thing that I think that tenants should understand is if you're going through what you perceive uh, is a, a issue, an action, harassment, or what you feel is discrimination, is you should reach out and see whether or not there is a federal law or a state law or somebody can assist you with it and not be scared to do so um, because the housing authority is not always going to be in the mood to just terminate you because you're raising too many complaints. If it's a legitimate complaint, it's fine. However, if you're suffering from issues that may uh, be that may be conducive with uh, paranoia, schizophrenia, and other issues, and you have a history of making exaggerated claims, then that could be kind of sticky situation as well. Well, I think we've reached uh, a pretty good part here. Did y'all have any questions? Um, yeah, we actually, we have quite a few. Um, sure. Let's start here. So what can you do when a landlord doesn't give the tenant notice of their intent not to renew the lease agreement, but give Section 8 notice? Section 8 will usually stop paying when they receive notice that the landlord is not renewing the lease agreement. So what does the tenant do to keep their voucher and what do they do about their housing? Well, uh, a non-renewal notice is uh, perfectly legal, and it doesn't have to have any reason that I'm aware of under law. If the, the landlord decides that, uh, I think that's the, the easy way out for most landlords. But, um, a non-renewal, that just means they don't want the apartment on market. Maybe they want to use a different way. So you can't really do a lot about non-renewal. Now, if they're doing a non-renewal as a retaliatory behavior from something that uh, has happened over the course of the last couple of months, 
then I would say to you that you likely have some type of case, but it would be kind of difficult to prove. Um, as far as them knowing a non renewal, it doesn't necessarily mean that the PHA or housing authority is going to retract the voucher and terminate you. Um, so that's not the problem. I think that if they want to do that, first of all, half contract usually will prescribe the, the landlord would need to contact the PHA and tell you, and it's the PHA or public housing authority's responsibility to notify you. That way you would be given an additional period to do your housing search. But as far as I know, Josh, uh, in poor tenants, uh, a non-renewal is simply that. There's nothing gregarious about it. It just simply means that they don't want to continue a relationship for any number of reasons. And they don't really have to explain that unless um, it's a situation where they're trying to terminate the lease uh, where it's not coming to an end. So, Okay. Uh, next one we have, how does smoking marijuana affect your Section 8 voucher in states where marijuana is legal? Let me give you some... Uh, Good old fashioned uh, advice. Okay. This is not going to be on the books kind of advice, but look, guys, the, we, we live in a country where people have many opinions. Okay. If you don't want to attract harassment and discrimination, I would suggest to you simply this if it's legal in the state, you can do it. But it doesn't mean that there is, aren't going to be better feelings. It would be better if you're using medical marijuana or CPBD and it's all legal for you to do so, then do it. Okay. But um, I don't know that I would necessarily want to arbitrate. So I'm not saying that uh, you that you should receive a dose of discrimination or harassment over it. Uh, I would say that it's a private matter. I mean, when you if you have a back surgery and you're taking a, a narcotic pain pill, do you go out by the pool and start popping those pills and tell everybody no? And I would suggest that the use of marijuana should be, you know, whether it's uh, liquid or smoke form that that should be something a matter that's taken care of in your home i don't know that you probably would want to advertise that uh i would say just keep the matter privately now if it's brought up in the context of we're aware that you're smoking marijuana in there well does the lease indicate that you're permitted to smoke in the apartment if it has a no smoking policy then that kind of goes in a gray area because you have to use your medication but you have a no smoking policy in there versus you losing your deposit. I would say that it's a minor, uh, a minor offense on the part of the landlord, but uh, I can also see, I don't know, Josh, you know, actually that's rather a neat question because I could see how many gray areas could be there. What if they have a no smoking policy? Most of my tenants choose to just keep it as a private matter. And then of course, when you move out, the uh, air out the apartment, I would not, uh, even in a legal state, I wouldn't put that on public display. Okay. Um, because it could be misconstrued and uh, though just, I wouldn't want to attract the attention, but if it's, if the landlord intentionally is targeting you over that, that I would certainly suggest that you probably have a case, uh, depending on what they're trying to do to you, because if it's legal for you to do so, then there's not, there should not be any retaliatory behavior and it shouldn't be any violation of uh, any, any part of the HAP contract, or it shouldn't be any violation of the lease unless it's specifically written in there. But okay. I'm, yeah. Great. I'm going to jump to this one. Uh, what should a tenant do when they live in a low income tax credit property or a project based housing and the building is condemned. In that circumstances, uh, the public housing authority is under certain obligations to assist the client with emergency housing. Okay. So if that thing, if the building has been deemed uh, unsafe to live in at that point, then they should be directly coordinating with you to either uh, find you a property which they own, which would be project-based and do it that way, or they should at least be assisting with the subsidy of possibly putting you in a hotel. Them taking zero action and then just putting you out the building and then telling you good luck is not, uh, that's certainly not legal in any respect. I think most PHAs handle that very well. Uh, you may not be pleased at the amount of time they usually take to do it, but um yeah, if uh, they put you out under contract, then they are absolutely, in my opinion, liable to assist you. And I think in most cases they do. Also, if you're really struggling, sometimes uh, public format is a great way to address it because a small media packet or even talking to local news would bring attention to it further. And then that may also assist the PHA and yourself uh, with other uh, buildings that may want to uh, potentially take on some of the uh, tenants. I've seen it play out a lot. I've not seen it to be a big issue, 
But if it's a large complex and everybody suddenly becomes homeless, then there would be interactions between that and the Housing First program. And uh, they would likely try to give you emergency funding for a hotel, at least till they could come to some kind of solution for your housing. Okay, great. Okay. I know Section 8 requires a new lease every year, but they do not always enforce this. What can a tenant do to make sure that they're able to get a new lease every year? Well, uh, when you're about, not, I would say to you that when you're about 60 days out, you need to have a discussion with the landlord. Now, obviously, you cannot force the landlord if they don't want to renew to renew, okay? But if everything has gone well and there hasn't been any problems, uh, I would suggest that you need to go down there and get a lease. I don't advise verbal leases at all because uh, those verbal leases, you don't know what the addendments are. You don't know what the rules are. And uh, though they're probably okay under law, I, I wouldn't go with a verbal lease because that would probably put you into what we call a, a month to month. And if you're in a month to month, they can terminate every 30 days if they want. So really, uh, that's just good standard practice to see. Um, but you can't really end, use a voucher in a month to month to start with. Okay. So if you go to a public housing authority, you get a voucher or you're dealing with a subsidy. Uh, when you get about 60 days out, there either needs to be the signing of another 12-month contract because that's what's required, or you'll need to go ahead and start your housing search again. You may not stop a landlord from not renewing. That's simply their option for them to exercise. Okay. All right. This question reads, you mentioned that you are responsible for your guests. What if your son comes and stays at the property despite you trying to get rid of them? Then your son brandishes a gun, and now you're facing an eviction and may lose your voucher, but you never wanted your son there to begin with. How can you make sure that you keep your voucher? And I think that's also a question I had uh, when you brought it up. Your responsibility for guests generally. How, how do you handle that sort of situation? If you invited that person on the property and you invited them, then you're liable. Uh, you're responsible for their actions on that property. If he shows up there unannounced, then that's, in my opinion, felony trespass and harassment. You are a victim as well of that, okay? Despite them being your family member. I would say that if they're not permitted on that property, they've come on and announced, then if you don't want to be at the, the wrong end of this deal, then you need to contact 911 and then have them leave that property. Otherwise, it's going to be viewed that you, you invited them there. If they're not supposed to be there, you got to get them all. And the leases, most leases these days are going to include uh, some type of information, I would think, about bad behavior by tenants. And in most cases, they view any of it as you being liable, but if they came unannounced and uh, they're trespassing, then that's what it is. So you've got to take the same um, and different actions as what the landlord would. Um, but in some cases, landlords won't understand. In that case, you better call an attorney because it gets it's it gets sticky fast. And I can't think of anything under policy and procedure that would defend uh, a client against that and um because housing authorities make snap judgments a lot the phas and if they don't if you're not if you know you've got a bad history with somebody there it is your like right now you're keenly aware that this could be a potential you should be first thing going down that leasing office here's a situation that may arise i want you to understand that i i'm not permitting them to come they come i just want to make sure i'm not going to get evicted so i'm making you aware that this person could come and trespass that way it's not a surprise anybody fair notice this fair notice then you in my opinion that that would uh, mitigate some of the liability but for you to keep that a secret in your home and wait for it to play out someday I wouldn't be advised. Uh, but as far as policies are concerned, I don't see anything under the PHA policies that would directly address that other than termination. And uh, But the lease could have some information in there under addendments. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. We have a couple that I'm going to go ahead and ask. Uh, they may be more suited for an attorney, but if you have an opinion on them, we'd love to hear it. Sure. Um, at what point can a landlord terminate a tenant who has significant mental health issues who's asked for accommodations for those mental health conditions? Oh, boy. Well, 
having a disability, mental or physical, doesn't necessarily mean you get to keep your lease. It depends on what's playing out, okay? The, so you have to step back from your situation. And uh, the landlord, uh, most landlords are not going to try to terminate somebody that's on spectrum, have Asperger's, autism, and all that. There's usually more to that story, okay? Now, uh, if they're trying to terminate, what is the cause or reason? What are you being accused of? Is there a history? Is there a matter of record where they've uh, approached you, mail letters and say, hey, you violated certain parts of lease? Now, um, if they're just telling you, hey, you know what? You're just a bit too unusual for us at the property. And uh, now you're really pushing the envelope and you're then they're prop they're denying uh, your disability rights. But again, you know, it's not disability rights we're discussing. We're kind of discussing the fact that you're requesting a modification or accommodation. It doesn't meet the standard of reasonable. And if if you believe that they're not wanting to do that in lieu of other behavior, so that's where it gets complex. I would really actually have to know a lot more about that case uh, where I can give an opinion. But Josh is right. You should, that is not something that it should ever be brought to my office. That should be brought to an attorney. Okay. All right. We had a question, um, maybe just to jump back to this. What is the voucher choice program and how does it work? Okay. So the housing choice voucher, uh, as it kind of suggests, is giving you the choice of taking a voucher and looking for a home anywhere in a community, whether it's a home, a duplex, a trailer, so on. It gives you a choice. In the early days of Section 8 and housing and subsidies, people were often relegated to properties owned by housing authorities. And over time, they built these wonderful structures, and um, you have a lot of low-income individuals and high concentrations, and then some behaviors would play out, and so it becomes difficult. So the housing choice voucher gives you the option to go live normally in the community, and you could have a house with a little yard, or you could get a duplex with a neighbor or two. So it really does give you the choice. Uh, and if there isn't an SOI or source of income issue there, then your request for tenancy for most landlords, as long as their payments are guaranteed and isn't going to drag out the H housing quality inspection, there are a lot of private landlords that may accept that voucher uh, on the condition that you don't, you know, do anything uh, bad. But um, the housing choice vouchers are issued by almost every housing authority in America. You have two options. You can deal with their project-based housing which they own the building and also issue the funding for it, or you may apply for the housing choice voucher where you grab the voucher, you're given a preliminary 60 days to find a place. You can potentially extend that extension up to about uh, four months, sometimes even six, if you have uh, other physical or mental disabilities disinfecting your hunt, but it gives you the choice. And then with that, uh, the housing choice voucher, would they would pay 70% of your rent so let will make a determination what your, what's rent is reasonable. And then 30% of whatever fixed income or job you have would be paid. So the government, 70%, you 30%, and then they would give you a budget, which means that voucher would be valued at a certain amount, say $1,200. You would be limited by that amount. And then they would tell you uh, the number of rooms that the home may have. Uh, you may be a single individual, but because of your disabilities, uh, you have extra medical equipment, so they may give you an additional room, but I wouldn't count on that always. Uh, so that's kind of the idea of what it is. Housing authorities typically have a range of waiting times anywhere from about six months up to 15 or even 20 years. Um, the closer into the center of the U.S. you get, the shorter the list, the farther out you get to the east and west coast, the more, uh, the longer it takes. <clears throat> and housing choice vouchers in most cases are not lotteries. Housing choice vouchers look at preferentials or preferences. These preferences can indicate that people will be prioritized higher if they are, have certain functional problems or they're of certain status. One uh, preference that will rank you fairly high is being a veteran. Number two, persons over 62 considered a senior. Number three, uh, you would say that a person with a disability, those that have experienced domestic violence, uh, those that are homeless or imminently homeless or chronically homeless. Then you have the basic stuff that's worth a little bit less value, like um, whether you're considered uh, average income, low income, or extreme low income. Extreme low income gives you a boost. Um, for those that don't have a potential uh, criminal history, uh, if you're going to seek this out, then I would suggest that if you had 
criminal activity related to methamphetamines, sex offenses, or being a sex offender, uh, that you're going to find that they're not going to likely issue a voucher. If you've got other activities, felonies or misdemeanors, and they're over five years, then you have a decent chance of receiving a housing choice voucher. And housing choice vouchers are not the only kind out there. You can go into the housing first programs and continuum of care, and they can also issue vouchers. They're a little bit lower tiered, but they work just as effectively, even if you have some kind of pass. Credit scores, you go over that just real quick. Uh, look, guys, everybody's keenly aware that persons that may be low income may not have the greatest credit, okay? You do not need 800 credit score. However, it's not the housing authority that's so much concerned with your credit scores. It's going to be the potential landlords, okay? So I would say to you that just having a little something on your record as a uh, criminal activity or that you have a low credit score is more something that landlords are concerned with than PHAs are, unless it's something very serious. Again, sex offenses, violent crimes, and methamphetamines, they've seemed to have targeted greater than any other drug. All right, that's that's my explanation on that one, Josh, sorry. All right, well, I think we've hit our time. Have we already? <laughs> already, yes, and we got to most of the questions. Good. Thank you, Jay, again, for your presentation earlier today and your presentation here this evening. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, not just today, but throughout the month for Fair Housing Month. I uh, hope everybody has a wonderful evening. And again, thank you for your attendance and take care. Thank you, Jay. Have a nice evening. everybody. Thank you all for having me. Okay. Bye-bye for now.